Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Zeno Antman and in the next good half an hour or so, uh, I'd like to make a call to think together. The title of this presentation is The Art of CISO. And by the end of this session, even though there will not be any demo here, I hope that by mixing art, logic, technology, and the people behind all of these can assist us in enhancing cybersecurity. A little bit of my background. Uh, I was lucky that I could have a hands-on experience of a great variety of aspects of IT, including cabling, building up new branch offices, supporting client and server-side computers and firewalls during the outsourcing era in the early 2000s. I was privileged that I could uh, be a member of a corporate IT audit team of a multinational corporation traveling the world uh, to audit the IT services uh, provided to the customers of this company and the IT security posture that was delivered to them during the early 2010s. Uh, later, in the late 2010s, I could lead a program that aimed to harmonize regulatory requirements globally and translate those to IT controls. And in the last uh, one and a half year or so, I act as uh, a CISO for a number of subsidies of uh, one of the largest banks in Hungary. So with that introduction, let me start to frustrate you on the next slide. Is there anything in common with these two pictures? Well, what possible could be in common in Leonardo da Vinci, in the IT guys of the 1990s, the CISO of our modern corporate world, and the art that we have in the title of this presentation? By the end of this session, we will establish a link and see that these seemingly distant things are not that far from each other. And the title hopefully will make some sense as well. But for that, we have to start a little bit farther. We need to understand a little bit of history, where we came from. The common thing behind both of these pictures is the concept. And that concept is already dead. Wow, some might say, that's gross. How can something be said even. Or some might say, well, hell yeah, it's dead, of course. So, well, the common thing, the concept behind Leonardo da Vinci's famous picture and a computer that uh, I used to learn uh, IT in high school is lying within the concept that they are representing. Leonardo was a polyhistor, or as literature often refer to him, a Renaissance man. The word polyhistor originated from the Latin and ancient Greek, meaning greatly learned. They are men who use both left brain and right brain type of thinking, and as a result, these are the characteristics of them. Curious, risk taker, creative, has perseverance, self discipline, has a thirst for knowledge and new experiences, excellence in physical, intellectual, artistic, and social fields, and including deep experience in at least one of the field and is exceptional in uh, some other fields, and most importantly, they are always learning. In the early stages of the computing era, when someone knew how to use a computer and how to fix it, they knew the computers, period. At that time, the IT guy of the 1990s was some kind of polyhistor as they knew the machine. They could write code, they could fix hardware issues, and do all kinds of magical stuff. However, 
like beginning from the Renaissance age, the aviable knowledge started to grow within this industry as well. Well, it became an industry as, <laughs> after all and became first harder and then later impossible uh, for someone to become a real polyhistor. Similarly, in our modern age, as uh, things getting more and more connected and the aviable knowledge within the IT industry grew, well, it became an industry for starters, people start to get specialized. Corporations became more and more complex entities with uh, numerous business units and organizations within them, of which more often than not have at least competing interests. Segregation of duties and the specialized and standardized tasks within a workflow process resulted in isolation and that high level leaders are less able to oversight the corporation as a whole compared to their ability to do so a decade ago. Technology became an integral part of the business in most cases without senior executives and the board's consciousness. Thus, today we live in an era of monoliths or specialists. Well, sure, you can say, okay, so what's the problem with that? Well, almost 30 years ago, two academic writers highlighted that business and marketing strategies should be viewed as interlocking rather than separate. Back then, they stated this for businesses and marketing strategies, and it was quite a thinking. Today, IT strategies can neither be overlooked nor handled separately. What else is a problem? Well, that humans don't change as fast as technology did, while culture itself changed as well. Edgar Schein defined organizational culture as a pattern of shared basic assumptions that the group learned as it solved its problems of external adaptation and internal integration that has worked well enough to be considered valid and therefore to be taught to new members as the correct way to perceive, think, and feel in relation to those problems. Have you ever heard this? We do things this way around here. This is the way we always did it. So what's the problem with specialists? The problem is that people stuck with one way of thinking. They have blinders on and they cannot see the big picture, including the relationship and similarities between different things. As I said, it seems that the concept of the Renaissance man is dead. But what the heck does it have to do anything with the, D, with the CISO and the title of this presentation. Well, like in any good sandwich, and I do apologize for the vegetarians and vegans here, the meat is in the middle. And in the case of the word CISO, the letters I and S are in the middle, meaning information and security. And in the media, Another word is often used uh, between uh, these two, which is uh, cybersecurity. We do believe that we know what they mean, but do we really know? So let's open up a little bit. Information. What is information? There are a number of different definitions. According to the Oxford Dictionary, in general, it means facts provided or learned about something or someone. In computer terms, it defines this word as data 
that is processed, stored, or transmitted by a computer. However, we can use a different approach, like legal boxes, if you like, the little uh, building boxes. Data, information, knowledge, wisdom. Let's say, for example, that uh, someone gets uh, data from my computer's browsing history and sees that uh, I was looking for information about the security requirements uh, of the Hungarian nuclear power plant. Uh, from the browsing history, they can see that uh, later I was listening to some German punk metal music and uh, was looking up to concerts of that band in uh, Berlin, Germany. Again, later uh, they can see that uh, I was looking for flights from Berlin to Budapest. So this is data. Once whoever got these individual data parts of my browsing history can say that uh, she or he has a piece of information about me and can make a deduction from these pieces of information and try to get knowledge from it. Using all these previous uh, examples uh, that whoever got this information um, maybe got uh, from my browsing history, combined it with my family name, Amtmann, which, which is a German name, uh, someone might deduct that uh, German cyberpunk wants to blow up Paksh, the Hungarian nuclear power plant. Deduction? Yes. Knowledge and wisdom? Not quite. See, putting it like this, it obviously feels bogus. But in reality, leaders are making decisions based on data that were organized into information by incorrect deductions, and they believe that they are acting on knowledge based on information and wisdom, while in fact, they have not. The second letter in the middle of the word is security. This word is defined as the state of being free from danger or threat. Well, this definition opens up a question. A question that how could we know whether we are free from threat? Especially today, when every source of news is full of reports of crimes, data leakage, attacking our personal and private information, and so on. The Committee of uh, Sponsoring Organizations of the Tradeway Commission, or COSO, developed the model, and uh, although it was updated in uh, 2013, uh, and it's a uh, cube now, I believe that uh, for this purpose, their original model could illustrate the concept I'd like to convey here better. So control environment. This is the basis and foundation of everything. Only when we knew with real knowledge can we assess the potential risks that can affect it. Once we know the risks that are applicable to whatever we have, we can develop controls to address these risks mitigate, accept, transfer. Once we put appropriate controls in place, we just have to monitor any changes, cha any changes in these uh, elements and adjust as needed for which information and communication are a key. And we come back to the communication part in just a little bit. Consequently, there is another word that is commonly used amongst the previous two, which uh, I mentioned, which is uh, cybersecurity. So let's have a little bit under the hood 
of the cyber part of this world. Cyber, according to Wikipedia, is derived from cybernetic, which uh, comes and originates from the Greek word, uh, I don't even try to pronounce that, uh, but uh, it means skilled in steering or governing. Cybernetics has been defined in numerous ways, such as the art of steermanship, the art of securing efficient operation, the art of effective organization, the art of interaction in dynamic networks, or a science that is connected with the study of systems of any nature, which are capable of receiving, storing, and processing information so as to use it for control. Okay. So now that we know what is information, what is security, let's have a look of an element that plays an important part in the equation, namely human beings, the individuals working within a company and their personality. And my apologies, again, let's pause here for a second and let's look under the hood the word personality. This word is originated from the Latin word persona, which was a mask that an actor wore during a play, which uh, signified his character by displaying it in an overamplified way. According to the American Psychological Association, personality refers to individuals, differences in characteristic patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving. This different behavior can play a part in two dimensions. Firstly, in a person's interactions with others, and secondly, an individual's reactions provided to a stimulus from the external world. In other words, in the first case, some folks are talkative in a party, some others are there to eat, drink, and to be left alone. In the second case, someone might crack under pressure, while some others get strength from it. One of the most well-known categorizations of the second case is the Myers-Briggs type indicator, or MBTI, which uh, categorizes people from four different aspects and uh, assessing people out of the 16 potential types, for example, extroverts and introverts. For the first case, Minzberg's categorization is the most well-known as he differentiated between 10 roles and three categories. Without going too deeply into the topic, I just like to highlight three which uh, could contribute the best for uh, a CISO. One of the most important roles lies within the information category, namely the disseminator role. In the information age, one of the most crucial key elements is the ability to understand, assimilate, and appropriately rely information. Remember, information and knowledge. In the interpersonal category, the two key roles for a CISO would be the leader and the liaison, as motivation internally and representing unity externally is vital. Lastly, the category related to the ability of decision making has two key roles, uh, which are the entrepreneur and the negotiator. As the prior one needs to realize the opportunities, both external and internal, and negotiate it and bring it through senior management and the board as needed. Okay, but why the heck are I talking about this? 
What do we want to achieve? What's the end game? Well, the end game is to secure information. Secure information. A data breach is an incident in which sensitive, protected, or confidential data has potentially been viewed, stolen, or used by an individual unauthorized to do so. IBM defined the data breach as an event in which an individual's name and medical record and or a financial record or by a credit debit card uh, is potentially put at risk either in electronic or paper format. The distinction of paper format is important. These numbers are actually scary. Cyber attack occurs every 39 seconds. The average time to identify and contain a breach across all industries is 279 days. It's more than nine months nine months and we can see the cost of the data breach uh, which uh, has consistently risen over the past year and the cost to recover from a ransomware skyrocketed as well an interesting twist that ransomware attacks nowadays are actually threatening their victims to release data rather than asking money to unlock a computer than uh, they started off with. Uh, the number of data breaches increased by 54% in the half, or first half of 2019. Uh, and in total, more than 4.1 billion records have been exposed in uh, the year 2019, so last year. On December 4, 2019, a security researcher discovered 2.7 billion email addresses and plain text passwords for more than 1 billion of them in an unsecured online database. Verizon's 2019 Insider Threat Report estimates that insider threat caused more than a third of all data breaches. As far as root causes, the 2019 IBM study found that 51% was due to malicious attacks and 24% due to human error. Only 25% caused by system glitches. According to a Forbes article, published in uh, April uh, this year, 70% of all data breaches are originated from endpoints, like laptop computers, phones, mobile devices, PCs. Further, due to the skyrocketed home office introductions across the globe, due to this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, May 2020, Forbes article predicts that the biggest cyber attack in history will happen in the next six months. Wow. How is it possible that we have this many breaches? How is it possible that with all of the increased spending and focus on information security, still 70% of all the breaches are originating from the endpoints? Well, at the end of 2019, people are still using the passwords that you can see on the left. In addition, more than 44 million Microsoft accounts were using passwords that had already been compromised elsewhere. So the question seems obvious. Will people ever learn? But 
the answer is not that obvious. The World Economic Forum provides an annual platform and an opportunity for leaders and uh, multi-stakeholders uh, <clears throat> to engage with each other. Participants of uh, this forum were asked to conduct and participate in the Global Risk Perception Survey, which is uh, published each year. According to this year's report, Although more than 50% of the world's population is online. I let it sink a little bit. More than 50% of all the population in the world are online. Still, approximately 1 million people go online for their first time each day. Let it sit this a little bit as well. One million people go online for their first time every day. Therefore, what might be repetitious and obvious for us in this uh, conference room and, and whoever uh, is listening to this, there are one million individuals each day who have no clue. In addition, these new users are mostly from developing countries and in the World Economic Forum survey, uh, they concluded that today's emerging economies are expected to comprise six of the world's seven largest economies by 2050. Respondents of the survey also rated information infrastructure breakdown as the sixth most impactful risk in the years until 2030, and cyber attacks on critical infrastructure were rated as the fifth top risk in 2020. And this is not just some irrational fear. Such attacks have already affected entire cities and multiple states. For example, in December 2019, New Orleans had to declare a state of emergency due to a ransomware attack. Shortly before that, the governor of Louisiana had to do the same. Earlier in 2017, an attacker could take down the emergency services number 911 in 12 states. Imagine the situation. You want to ask for help from 911 or from uh, 112, call the police and the service is down. Could be shocking, especially if you are in uh, that situation when you would desperately need uh, help. An interesting fact is that uh, only 5.9% of the emergency centers had any program or plan to address events like that. So public and private sectors are alike at risk of being compromised and or held as a hostage. Organized cybercrime entities are joining forces and the likelihood of detection such an organization and the prosecution is estimated to be as low as 0.0. .0 5% in the US. We all heard about the software as a service and platform as a service uh, model. Well, there is a cyber crime as a service, which is also a growing business model. As the increasing sophistication of tools on the darknet makes uh, malicious services more affordable and easily accessible for anyone. Some experts stated after the New Orleans state of emergency that CISO's focus on technological defenses when they should also be patching their colleagues with regular stimulated attacks and uh, security awareness training. Besides all of these threats, the amount of data that we generate, both structured and unstructured, is exponentially and we almost could say concerningly 
going. In addition, the fourth industrial revolution, technologies will dramatically reshape economies and societies. Who makes money and how has already changed, and is it still changing? Dr. Zoltan Cefavi, uh, ambassador of Hungary to the OECD and the UNESCO, quoted uh, Cleve Humbley, a Sheffield mathematician, who stated that data is the new oil and highlighted that on a data economy, uh, highlighted on a data economy conference in January 2018, that the age of globalization is over. Today, there is a shift towards the age of technology and new economic models, such as peer-to-peer -peer economy, sharing or on-demand economy, collaborative economy, and platform economies. In the data-driven economy, ownership is replaced by access and products by services. According to the IDC, by 2020, 50% of large enterprises will be generating data as a service revenue from the scale of data. And by 2025, 50% of the revenue will be generated by sharing economy, while it was only 5% back in 2013. Uber, one of the world's largest taxi companies, owns no vehicle. Facebook, the most uh, popular uh, media owner, actually creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider owns no real estate. Since the Industrial Revolution, the world has developed a complex supply chain from designers, manufacturers, to distributors, to importers, wholesalers, and retailers. It is what allowed billions of products to be made, shipped, bought, and enjoyed in all corners of the world. However, in recent times, the power of the internet, especially the mobile phone, has unleashed a movement that's rapidly destroying these layers and moving power to new places. So it's clear that demographics have changed. Even the skills that brought our society to wherever we are today have changed. The previously mentioned uh, World Economic Forum survey concluded that approximately 50% of companies worldwide predict that automation will trim their current full-time workforce by 2022. And by that same year, researchers expect at least 55%, 54% of employees will need reskilling and upskilling to complete their jobs. Folks, this is just two years from today, not in some distant future. And in this economy, where data is the new oil, the question arises, who owns and who controls the data? And who is protecting all these information? Okay, so we know all this see this. But there is another hidden challenge besides the obvious ever-increasing rate and sophistication of the tech vectors, which is unfortunately senior management and the co corporate culture. Ooh, that's harsh. I know, I know. Still, it is our reality more often than not. Well, we know that there is no such Thing as 100% secure environment. Security costs money. And when appropriate funding is requested from the board, who might not have a clear understanding of the full depth of the IT security, as we discussed earlier, uh, the change happened without their consciousness, they might ask, okay, so we are spending this money now on this fancy new firewall, I understand, but uh, what's on the income side? 
Well, this mindset, unfortunately, seems to be validated by a survey conducted amongst uh, CISOs that found that almost a quarter of interviewed CISOs said that boards didn't accept or understand that breaches are inevitable and said that they hold them personally accountable for any incidents. So it would seem that culture and corporate and organizational culture plays a vital role here. Remember we talked about the importance of the foundation of everything earlier when we had a look at the COSO triangle. I mentioned that we will discuss the information and communication part a little bit more later. Well, this is later. Uh, as it was mentioned there, if senior management uh, acts based on an understanding that it is not funded on knowledge, they cannot act even with their best interest in place appropriately. I have seen far too many times that middle management simply does not report yellow or red KPIs or SLAs to senior management because of various reasons. It has to be green, they said. Well, in September 2015, electronics conglomerate Toshiba admitted that it had overstated its earnings by nearly 2 billion over seven years. Independent investigators found that Toshiba had a corporate culture in which management decisions could not be challenged and employees were pressured into inappropriate accounting by postponing loss reports or move, moving center certain loss and costs into later years. Another example, probably one of the most well-known to date, and of course we can thank the birth of uh, SOX and many regulations since then, uh, is the Enron scandal. The company reportedly has had a go-go culture in which senior officials uh, cast aside traditional business controls. It is possible that all of these previously mentioned facts were part of a reason why 86% of the participants of the 2014 World Economic Forum survey identified a crisis in leadership as the world's most pressing issue and 51% of the respondents of the 2018 World Economic Forum survey expected that the risk of authoritarian leadership would increase in 2019. William H. White, an American organizational analyst said that the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. One of uh, my first mentors said to me that uh, thinking is hard work. That is why so few people do it. Charles Perrault, a famous so social ecologist, described today's world as a complex and tight coupled system in which even a small issue can cause cascading effects. That is why it is so important to start thinking again and see the big picture. Vincent Van Gogh said, that great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Vince Lombardi, a famous American football coach, said that the achievements of an organization are the results of the combined effort of each individual. You can say that these sentences feel obvious or cliche, but the fact is that in our world, and day-to-day -day work. We are doing the trimmed down, blindsided down work of a whole we might not even oversee even more. And in many cases, we don't even realize this, but we should, because in the IT world, the Renaissance was only 30 years ago. So why do I believe that it is an art to be a CISO? Because they have to see the big picture understand the engine room, understand the fly deck, and the environment, the playing field as well, speak their respective languages, and have the ability to relay between these layers. 
However, security is not a one-man show. We are in this boat together. We are all responsible for the security of tomorrow. A developer cannot say that I code this because I always did that in this way or because they didn't specify any security requirements, why should I care? Everyone should work together, do their part, because a series of small acts from different divisions and roles can produce a great deal and enhance security overall. So it is not just uh, the CISO who has to do the art. It is us, everyone who is listening to uh, this uh, recording, uh, everyone who is within this industry. It is our shared responsibility towards ourselves and towards each other as well. Like in the way we are responsible for children, we are responsible for those 1 million new children, those individuals who go online for their first time every day. It is our responsibility to develop applications in a safe way secure by design and not just because of the regulatory expectation but because we understand that it is in our best own interest as well so if we'd like to see a better nicer picture of security of tomorrow we everyone who is listening to this presentation have the power we have the brushes in our hands so let's start painting it today thank you very much